Hey, good morning, everyone in Business Law One. Uh, we're now on Chapter Six, which is Offer and Acceptance or Meeting of the Minds. Many people think this is the heart and soul of any measure of whether or not there's a valid contract between the parties. But we know from Chapter Five, we need all five of those core elements in order to satisfy um, the legal standard of whether or not a contract exists. And why do we care? Because we know if their contract exists, it can be legally enforceable if one party fails to go forward, the um, the victim or, or, or the party harmed has a right to sue for damages. Um, so the first element is offer and acceptance or a mutual meeting of the mind. Second one, of course, this little review of chapter five, is consideration. Something needs to flow back and forth in terms of legal obligation between the parties. The third element or, or um, factor, if you will, that goes into the analysis of whether there's a valid and binding contract is were the parties competent and did they have capacity? Then the, the fourth one is it has to be for a legal purpose. Sometimes it, people think right away, it goes, well, if it's obviously for some kind of criminal nefarious conduct, it can't be an enforceable agreement under the law. But some things simply just are illegal. They're not um, permitted under the law. They have nothing to do with criminality at all. And then the fifth element, sometimes it has to be in a special form. Um, but not not in most circumstances, we don't have to have a special form. We don't have to have a writing. That surprises a lot of people. But hey, we're on chapter six. What is offered acceptance? Vocabulary becomes very important. I know it can be intimidating to people, but you need to know the offer or is the person making the offer. You might as well call them that. I'll try to do that in the test. And, and, and you should try to be able to break that down in life. Don't worry about vocabulary. Once you get accustomed to it, you realize it's, it's not rocket science exactly. But the offer or is the one making the offer. The offeree is the one receiving the offer. It can be multiple parties, but for practical purposes, we use just two parties for almost all the examples I'll try to give during the course of the class. Um, and what has to be in an offer is three basic sort of, I guess you would call them elements to determine whether or not there's a valid offer made to the offeree. So the offer or it has to be definite. And that's the big one. It has to have things like what exactly is the offer or offering to do or to exchange to the offeree to, in order to enter into a binding contract. Things like what services are going to be supplied, what goods are going to be exchanged, what's expected of the offeree in exchange for that. Is it money? Is it services? Is it uh, in exchange for legal rights? Whatever it is has to be fairly clearly spelled out. Otherwise, we don't know what the parties are agreeing to. Think about it. You go to court and say, this party agreed to do some things for me and they were going to give me some stuff in exchange. And of course, says, well, what, what did they agree to do? You know, you, know you, you have to have some specificity as to what the parties are actually agreeing to do. You can't say, hey, I'm thinking about selling you some of my, I am a, uh, for example, I'm a, a political button collector. In some of my videos, you'll see the political buttons behind me in my uh, office. Um, and say you were into the, the hobby as well. And I say, he goes, hey, I'm thinking about selling you some of my political buttons. And you say, great, I'm buying do we have an agreement? No. Well, not even talking about the acceptance, the offer or is not making an offer that has enough definiteness. We don't know about price, quantity, which buttons. We don't know anything about it. We don't know what the price is being demand. You have to be careful about all these elements though. Some of them aren't always required in law, including price. Most people think by just common sense that, well, if you don't set out what the price is between the parties for a good, you don't have a valid offer because there's not enough definiteness. And I would say generally as a default, that's not a bad analysis. But sometimes, especially merchants and dealing with goods in large quantities that are traded on the, the market, there's sometimes just an expectation that price will be set by the market variable. So say, I don't know, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big meat producer, I'm Hormel and, I'm, uh, and I go out and I make offers to all these large farmers out there that raise um, pigs and I say, you know, I'm, uh, we're in the market to buy so many hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of pork bellies. And you say, we agree, we, we, we'll sell them to you. And no one ever said it the price, but we set the amount in the specific quality maybe of the pork bellies that we wanted, but we never said the price. Could that still be a valid offer? Yeah, it could be because in that industry, prices are probably set on the commodities market at the time and date of the contract entry. It's just like if I say, okay, I agree to buy your IBM stock today, and I go on to E-Trade, um, the prices implicitly, the market 
uh, stock exchange price at that moment. And so don't get lost on the fact that sometimes the price isn't there. Usually it does have to be there. We need definiteness. The next one, it must appear to be seriously intended. This is an objective standard. So if I'm obviously joking around with you, and I know you always wanted my old convertible car, and I know you really admired it, and I let you use it from time to time, and one day, you know, we're laughing, and some friends, and goes, I'll sell it to you for $5,000. And clearly, the car is worth a lot more. Everyone's laughing. Everyone knows I don't have any real intent to sell it, including you, who I've offered to sell it to. That's not a valid offer, because it's offered in jest. It's a joke, and it's obvious objectively around the circumstances. But what if I decided just to be cruel and I seem to be making a real offer to you and it's, you know, in the ballpark of what the car's worth. And I say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to sell you my, my, my Roadster for um, $15,000 as long as you can come up with the money in the next week. Uh, and I'm doing just and afterwards, once you say yes and you get all excited, ah, I'm not selling it to you. That would actually be something I might not be able to walk away from because it appeared on the surface on the objective standards around everyone that observed it, that I seriously intended to make that offer to you. So it can't be the personal internal view of the offeror as to whether or not they seriously intend it. It's an objective standard around the circumstances that um, show intent. Uh, the other one is about anger. And uh, so it's not always just about joking. And I'll give you an example. My brother, I, I was just talking to him recently. He retired, he's six years older than me. And, um, he retired very young, obviously, uh, but he's six years older. I mean, when he was in the Coast Guard, he got out after um, one of it. He did two terms. After one of his terms, he got out. And I always remember him buying a Oldsmobile Delta 88, this really long car. It looked similar to a Cadillac. It actually had the wings in the back a little bit, not huge, but it looked like a, a little bit like a limousine, actually. And I don't know why he wanted it, but he thought it was the coolest thing in the world. He, he spent a fair amount of money for it. And let's say in today's market, he spent $25,000 for this used car. And he loved it. And he did all of his own maintenance on it. And I remember him being out of the car and he was changing the uh, oil filter. He was doing his own, his own oil change. And he um, was having a hard time getting the filter off. And he had to, I guess, punch a screwdriver through the filter to get leverage to get the thing off. And he was swearing and he was doing those things. And I kind of liked the car. And I'm just, again, I was probably... See, I think I just had my license or I was about to get my license and my and my brother used to tease me jokingly from time to time that he was going to sell me the car for this dollar. This might obviously not a seriously intended offer. It's not an offer. It doesn't have seriousness. But this time he's busting his knuckles underneath. He can't get the air filter off. He comes out of the underneath the car and he's furious. He goes, and he goes, hey, you, you know, of course, I being sort of obnoxious, I said, you know, how do you like the car? You know, because I know he's upset. That's what brothers do to people like each other, I guess. And he says, he says, I'll sell it to you right now for $1,000. Now, it sounds like we have enough terms. It's the Delta 88. I don't know what year it was. This is probably back in 19, I don't even get the, the year, but a long time ago. And we clearly identified the item being exchanged. We clearly identified the amount of money. And it seems serious in terms of language. He wasn't doing it in a joking way. But was he serious in the sense that he had true intent? And the answer is no. He's just venting out of anger. He doesn't really mean to sell it. And I've, I've seen other people do that too when they're upset about a business or a thing they have. And they say, I, I just want to throw it away. I want to get rid of it. It's not serious. It's just venting. And so we take it as an objective standard, what would be reasonable for a court to conclude that does a person really have true intent to enter into a binding agreement when they're in a moment of anger? The last one, it must be communicated to the offeree. This surprised a lot of people. So say I seriously do want to sell uh, my buddy my iPhone. Uh, for, I don't know, this is an older model, so I don't know, $500. And I even write it up to, to my buddy uh, John Doe. I, I agree to sell my iPhone for $500, payable within three days. And I date it and, and I sign it. But I'm, I'm not quite sure I want to do it yet, so I have it on my desk. And for whatever reason, my secretary sees it, and she knows John Doe. He's maybe a, another friend down the hall in the office complex we work at. And she goes, oh, I'll go drop it off. That's actually not a valid offer because the offeror is the owner of the offer. The owner of the offer can dictate whom he or she wants to deal with. So that offer isn't open to the world. It's open only to John Doe when I decide to communicate it to him. Now, if I don't communicate it to him or I change my mind, I just leave it in my desk, the offer never gets, it, it never becomes a true offer because it doesn't meet that third element. It has to be communicated to the offeree. Now, what if my secretary, Jane, comes in and says, 
goes, oh, you're, you're selling your iPhone for $500. I'd like to buy it for $500. I accept your offer. She doesn't have the power to do that. She has a power to make an offer to me, but she doesn't have a power to accept the offer that I'm making to John Doe because we have the right to decide who we wish to contract with in this world. Now, somebody goes, oh, that's not true. You have to, well, it is true. You can actually decide who you wish to do business with. And the thing you're probably intuitively thinking of is you can't discriminate if you impact interstate commerce on race, color, creed, national origin, sexual orientation, age, um, religion, you know, the, the core quality characteristics that we as a society have decided to make it illegal to discriminate over. But other than that, we're free to, to decide who we want to do business with and who we don't want to do business with. So th those are the three elements of any offer. And the one that we really concentrate on, the one that most of the litigation over is, is it definite enough? Is there enough clarity as to what the offeror is offering the offeree so we know what they're trying to be bound into? And and, and I got to admit, I've, I'm, I always, I don't do a lot of contract work anymore, but I dreaded it a little bit because I know what it's like getting a call on Friday afternoons at, you know, 445, you're trying to get out of the office a little early on a weekend, maybe it's a three-day weekend, and you get that call and you say, hey, remember that contract you wrote for me last year? Well, we got a huge problem. You know, there's a big argument over whether or not we have this obligation or they have this obligation, and we have a big fight over it. And you wrote the contract, so you got to kind of get us out of this problem. That's a terrible feeling. Um, so when I ever wrote contracts, I always, always, and that's why when you get involved with lawyers and paralegals and legal assistants, people say, oh, why are the contracts so thick when it seems like such a simple thing? Because everyone's considering all the different contingencies and issues that might come up in terms of costs and duties and obligations that flow back and forth. We want to make sure we have something where if something comes up in terms of a question, we have an easy answer. We look to the document. We looked if it is a written contract and, and as a lawyer, I if I'm going to do an important contract, I prefer a written one for that very purpose. Because when you tend to write things down, you tend to get into the details and make sure you cover yourself in terms of what the parties are actually agreeing to do and not do. So that's the big one. It has to have definiteness. So let me see if they, they put in here what in the book I think does a very nice job and just kind of outlining what definiteness is. It says a contract will not be enforced unless the court can determine what the parties agree to. Just like I said. The offer's intentions are ascertained from the offer, and these intentions cannot be ascertained unless the offer is definite. Terms usually, not always now, usually required to state include the identity of the offeree, like who am I making the offer to, who am I as the offeror, the subject matter of the offer. It's the car we're selling. It's that political button. It's painting that house at 123 Green Street. Why is it important to identify which house? Because houses have different size, different textures, and different... Um, Degrees of difficulty in terms of painting. The price, the quantity. Yeah, I'll buy your political buttons. How many? Which ones? Identify them. And that's one of the things we get into later chapter is called identification of goods. Very important. In time or performance. And again, price sometimes isn't required. Also, sometimes time or performance is not required. So I used to paint for a living when I was in college. Um, my buddy uh, recently died, passed away. We became very close friends. He's older than me by almost exactly 20 years. He, um, he and I would paint houses and uh, <laughs> hardest job I ever had. And, uh, physically, I mean, it was out in the sun, I, I hate it. I have skin problems to this day from being out in the sun painting with him. But sometimes we wouldn't put time or performance. We'd come out and we'd look at a job and he taught me how to bid a job based upon the size of the house, how many you know, if we're going to supply the paint, all that kind of stuff. And we'd say, okay, you know, back in the day, now it costs a fortune to paint the house. Um, but back in the day, we came up with a very, it was a small ranch. We're going to put two coats on. We, we quote $2,000 to get it done. We write it up in that contract would not have to be in writing. We'll get to that in a later chapter, but, but we do write it up anyways, $2,000 to get the paint done and say it's, it's, I don't know, we're, we're meeting with the homeowner in June, but we don't say in the contract that this will be done within two weeks of the signing of this contract. We used to often leave time of performance open. Why? Because sometimes we had a very busy workload and we didn't want to shy away from that potential, you know, cash cow of making money off these clients. And we hope we could delay maybe doing the work a little bit later. But in the industry of painting or any other kind of work that's like a, a, a skilled labor type position type things, it's presumed 
the, a reasonable period of performance would be included, like painting. I say I hired someone to mow my lawn. Do I expect them to come out that very day? No, but me being a little, you know, uptight, I'd say, well, when are you coming out? I, I want to know. You know, I want to be here. Um, but generally speaking, that wouldn't have to have a time of performance. It'd be a reasonable period of time. So if I hired someone today to come out and manu- what do you call it? manicure or you know, mow my lawn and do the shrubs and all that kind of stuff, when would they have to do it? Well, I think a month would be too long because then I'd be have a hay field in my yard. But would a week be reasonable from the time I contract with them? Probably. And so therefore, I don't think for purposes of definiteness, we'd have to put time of performance in that contract because it would be reasonable under the circumstances. I know. I talk way too much. I apologize. Uh, this one's going to throw a lot of people off, and I only cover it briefly because it doesn't come up too much because there's other protections in the law called, we'll call it basically consumer protection fraud and false advertising. You can't do it. But generally speaking, with a store, say it's Walmart or GameStop or these other stores, put up an ad in a flyer and say, we have new Xbox. I don't even know what no iteration we're on or new Sony Playstations for $500. That sounds like an offer. It sounds like it's seriously intended. It's communicated in an advertisement. I got it in my mailbox. I open it up. Is that an offer that I can just simply accept? Believe it or not, it's not. It's called an invitation to make offers. Now, if I go down to GameStop and I say, I got this advertisement mail, $500 for new PlayStation. I accept. Here's my $500. Please give it to me. And they say, oh, no, no, it's actually $600 um, because the demand went up. Can they do that? Under contract law, they actually can. Because what they're doing by doing broad mailings or internet advertising on a web page or commercials on television or the like is actually trying to get consumers to come in and not accept their offer, but really to offer them to purchase the goods. Now, why is it that we don't think this way? It's because 99% of the time, whatever their invitation is to the you know to, to the public as a whole, they're going to honor it because they're going to be in trouble with all kinds of public service agencies about truth and advertising and fraud and all kinds of things like that. You're not allowed to do false advertising. So they're usually going to honor that. But the reason why they're not bound and it's considered an invitation to make bids, what if GameStop has, I don't know, at the local store, they have 25 new PlayStations and they have them advertised for $500. I'm the 26th person that comes in and say, I accept your offer. They haven't revoked the offer. They haven't done anything to let me know that it was invalid. And they say, we don't have any more. Would they be in breach of contract if I accepted before they've revoked? Yes. So that's why it's not an offer. It's an invitation to make bids. Probably the better example is real estate. My son just bought his first house, for example. Perfect example is my son's house. I don't want to say the price, but we went out there and he liked it and he could afford it. And it's pretty close to here where I live now. And um, the realtor knows my sister or whatever, but you know, we're talking. And my son says, yeah, I want to put an offer. And dad, so I'm a lawyer, so I'm helping him put the offer together. And we make an offer and she goes, Jim, I'm, we've already got a full price offer. So you're going to have to offer more than what the sellers are asking for. So let's just say, for example, the sellers say, you know, whatever, A-frame house across the street from the lake, lake views, all this kind of stuff. And they say $300,000. If you come and say, I accept, they can say, no, we don't want to sell it. Because they're putting out a sign and they're communicating on Realtor.com and MLS, multiple listing service, all this stuff, actually isn't an offer to the to society or to the public. It's actually an invitation for people to come and make bids. And that's why it's legal for somebody to come in and say, I will pay you the 300000 and why it's legal for the homeowner to say, I'm not selling it for 300000 I, I you know, regret, I decided to keep the house. Or someone came in and overbid because there's a bidding war. I don't know, depending on when you see this video, I mean, it's fresh today at the moment of making it, but I might use it next year and the year after if I think it's fairly straightforward and simple. But there has been in, in this current real estate market bidding wars where you know, realtors think, oh, I think our house is worth three hundred thousand dollars. Let's put it in the market for three ten. We'll see what we get. Thing sells for three fifty. That's because the original listing price is not an offer. It's just an offer, or it's just an invitation to make bids. Now, this surprised a lot of people. The duration of the offer. What do I mean by the duration of offer? So, I agree to sell you my cell phone, five hundred dollars, and make it clear it's offered to you. I'm seriously intending it. No joke. No anger. How long is that offer for? A minute, day, forever. Can you come back to me in a year from now and say, Carmen, you offered me to sell your iPhone for me for $500. I now accept. I'm like, what? I don't even have that phone anymore. 
or I don't even know who you are. I don't remember doing it. So there's rules about how long an offer stays open. As a general principle, if I offer to sell me something and I don't put a time frame in, this offer is good for three days. Well, we know if I say this offer is good for three days and I make it now at this date and time, it's good for three days and it automatically expires at the end of three days. On the fourth day, if you decided to accept, you no longer could accept my offer. You could make a new offer to me, change the role. You're now the offeror and I'm now the offeree. But if I put a time frame in, which is always wise, I think, if you're the offeror, hey, I'm willing to sell you my book, Business Law One, for $20. But I don't say how long the offer is open for. Could you accept it tomorrow? Could you accept it next week? Could you accept it next month? And the law here tries to create a standard that's flexible. It's determined based upon reasonableness. So if the offeror is smart, they'll put a time frame in. This offer is good for two hours. I used to do some personal injury stuff and, and other litigation. And sometimes the other party would, would contact me and say, we have an offer for you. They'd make an offer and say, this offer is good for 24 hours because they want to bring resolution to a matter. They don't want the offer hanging out in the wind like that. They want to know whether they can move on from it or it's going to be litigated or whatnot. And so they often put a time cap on. And I did that in real estate when my son and I put it on. He actually was successful. He was successful uh, on the purchase. We put an offer in. I knew the sellers were away. I wanted to give them some time to mull it over. And I think we put a bid in on Thursday and I kept the offer open till Monday at 6 p.m. And I wrote it right in there. In fact, it's a model form for real estate, how long the offer stays open. That way we know. And it puts a little bit of ease. It's like, what are we going to find out? What are we going to find out? We'll probably find out Monday afternoon whether they accept, reject, or make a counter offer, which I'll get to in a moment. So duration of the offer. Whatever's in the offer determines how long the offer is open. If there's nothing in the offer, it's a reasonable period of time. So it's very contextual. Think about what if this hot cup of coffee, well, now it's lukewarm. But say it was in a, you know, a, uh, a styrofoam cup from Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, that's lukewarm. Uh, and I just bought it. I didn't handle it too much or anything, so it's not gross. And I, I bought an extra one. One of my buddies don't show up. And then I see a third guy there. And I say, hey, I got an extra cup of coffee here. And you can see the steam still coming out of the top of the cup. And, you know, all the accoutrements, the cream and sugars are on the outside, if you like that kind of stuff. And I say, hey, I'll sell you this cup of coffee for a buck. How long does that offer stay for? It's a hot cup of coffee. Say it's a winter day, you know, and we're outside. A hot cup of coffee outside in a um, styrofoam cup, that offer is obviously going to be, I don't know, 20 minutes tops, half hour, maybe an hour. After that, the offer expires by its nature of the thing involved. It, it'll spoil. Or how about a liverwish sandwich with mayonnaise? And it's, you know, it's it's mid-August and it's really hot out. And I open it up out of the cooler and I have it on the table and I offer you to sell that liverwish and mayonnaise sandwich for two bucks. And I don't put a timeline about how long you can determine whether or not you wish to accept or not. It's obviously a fairly short period of time because that will spoil. The phone, I don't know, days, maybe a week. I don't know what's reasonable under the circumstances. So that's the one that we have a lot of litigation over, what's reasonable. So the first one is the offer lasts until the amount of time we specifically state and express in the offer. The other is a reasonable period of time, which is most common. Most people don't put specific times in their offer. The, I want to jump to a firm offer real quick. A firm offer is very narrow, and a lot of students get confused and think it's true of every case that – Whenever you make an offer and you don't put a specific deadline in it, it expires in 90 days. That's only true of a firm offer. What's a firm offer? It's an offer made by a merchant that is in the regular course of business selling goods or services of those kind. So if Sherwin-Williams makes an offer to me to sell me paint at a certain price and they don't give a timeline how long that offer is good for, if it's in writing and signed or endorsed by their agent, that offer will stay open for 90 days as a firm offer. They could put the offers good for seven days. It's only good for seven days, but I'm saying if they're silent to it, they put it in writing and they're a merchant. Got to meet all those elements. Then it stays open for 90 days under the UCC. And someone can say, what's the UCC? There's this uniform commercial code that almost every state's adopted uniformly. That's why we call it uniform. Some states have tweaked it a little bit. But generally speaking, we all stand by it throughout the country. So that's what's nice about this class. It's pretty much universal no matter where you go. So that's a firm offer. 
the next one, one I mean, right. And so it expires in 90 days if in writing and signed by the offeror. Uh, another way it can determinate, uh, terminate, I should say, is if the person who makes the offer to you goes insane prior to acceptance. So I offer to sell you my phone and I become incompetent through, you know, um, some kind of dementia or mental health deterioration or something like that. And I become what's thought of as insane under the concepts of law. The offer terminates during that period of time. Another one is if I offer to sell you this phone and you agree today, but I die before I get a chance to deliver it, you get to pay me. That's actually still a vile contract. My estate would have to comply with it and you'd pay the estate and they give you the money. But what if I just made you the offer you hadn't had a chance to accept, you're mulling it over and I die. The offer dies with me. Kind of common sense. Um, the next one is rejection. So I offered to sell you myself for $500. He goes, no way, Corman. That's a rejection. A rejection erases it off the board. Think about me writing the offer in chalk on the board. You reject it. It's off. Say it, you, you say, no way, Corman, I'm not paying $500. Then you're walking down the hall. Maybe you just don't know how much phones go for. And you say, hey, Corman's phone, I don't know what it is. iPhone 12, I don't know, 10, 9, I don't know what it is. But, but you, know, you start talking to your friends. You say, well, that's a really good deal. And all of a sudden you have regret. And you come back and goes, Jim, I now accept your offer. You can't because you rejected it. It's off the table. What you're actually becoming is now you can become the offeror, make an offer to me to buy it for $500. But my original offer is off the table and you can't buy me to it. Rejection. The last one that gives in the book is it becomes impossible. I agree to sell you my cell phone. Uh, you know, it's, I don't know, I'd say it's at night. And during the middle of the night, my house gets struck by lightning and the house burns down. We all survive, including the dogs here that are driving me crazy at my feet. They um, will, the law will, will basically say it terminates because of impossibility. The subject matter of the contract or offer is just removed. And that's kind of common sense. Now, this is the one that throws everyone off a little bit is counter offers. And it happens all the time in business, not just in business, but in, in practical everyday dealings with things. I agreed to sell you my bicycle, my, you know, pedal bicycle, uh, it's a touring bike. You can put things called panniers on the side. And I agree to sell it to you for 700 bucks. It's a nice bike. And you come along and you look at it and say, hey, it is a nice bike. Corman, I'll give you 600. What we have there is an offer and not an acceptance. We have a counter offer. What does that do to my original offer? It races it from the board. It's gone. So I look at you and I said, no, I wanted 700. I'm not accepting 600. You know, cheapskate, see you later. And then you say, but gee, I really wanted Jim. I'll pay you 700. Do I have to now enter into that agreement? Do I have to now give them the bike and they have to give me the 700? No, because they counter offered, it erased my original offer off the board. Now, in practical circumstances, if I wanted 700 for it, you offered me six and I said no, but you turn around moments later and say, okay, I'll give you the seven. Chances are I'm going to accept that, but what am I actually doing? You're not accepting my offer for 700. You're actually creating a new offer for 700 because your counter offer erased it from the board. It's very, very important to understand this because parties can be fearful that they're bound into an offer that they have out there to multiple offerees. I offer to sell my, my bike to several different people. Every time a counter offer comes in, I know I'm now safe to remove that party from entering into a, a binding contract with me, unless I accepted their counter offer or I revived my offer. Counter offers kill original offers. Counter offers actually basically not only kill the original offer, it changes the party's role. The offeror is now the offeree and the offeree is now the offeror. And I think the book really describes it well. And you gotta play with it, do the case problems over and over again to get comfortable with a counter offer is. Um, so what does the acceptance have to be? And I used to show a video in class, but because of copyright issues, and I thought because it's a law class, I should comply with the law. I can't put it up here on the, on the webpage, but it's, it's called the mirror image rule. So, and, and this, this professor that used to make this video, he goes, think of it as a spider or an octopus on a mirror. All the tentacles and legs have to be identical from what the offer is to the offeree. The mirror image is exactly the same. So if I agree to sell you my car for $5,000 and you say, I agree to buy for $5,000, we probably have an offer acceptance. But if I offer 
I'll sell you my car for $5,000 and you turn around and says, I accept provided you put on four new tires or I accept provided you go get it inspected and it passes or I accept provided you put new windshield wipers on. You haven't accepted. What have you done? You've made a counteroffer because we don't have the mirror image rule. The acceptance has to be identical to the offer in terms of all material aspects. Sometimes little minor things aren't considered a counteroffer because they're mere inquiries. And I'll get to that in one moment. But generally speaking, it has to be identical or it's a counteroffer and the deal's off. And you get that happen quite a bit. Um, I recently sold, well, I didn't, but my, 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 my wife had a, his daughter had a car that was just, oh my God. I never seen a car so so bad looking, at least in my life. And my mechanic liked it because it ran well. It just looked awful. And anyway, I ended up giving it to him for some mechanic work on my other car. I had a mechanical work on my other car. And he joked around and says, he goes, geez, I should have charged you money. I've never seen so many French fries in the car. And, and, and her kids were similar to my kids growing up. Uh, I remember when I was getting rid of one of my cars, I said, I got to clean it out. I'm going to trade it in. I was buying another car. And I was cleaning out the back area of this minivan I had. And I had my back there once a month. I don't know what it is with French fries, but they pile up. Uh, but I always think about that when I made an offer to sell a car, that the the recipient of the offer, the offeree, would counter offer. Okay, I accept, provided you remove all those French fries. That would actually be a counter offer, and it, that that would actually make my offer be removed from the table if I so wished. Or I could simply do what? I could accept their new and different offer because it's different than my original offer. It's a counter offer, and I could accept it. Could say, okay, I'll sell it for five thousand, and I will clean out the French fries. Um, so that's called the mirror image rule. And it's, it very rarely does silence ever um, act as acceptance of less in the industry. That's the standard in it. Or if it's merchants doing it, meaning if a merchant writes me a letter and I'm a merchant and they put a, they put a written, you know, that if I don't hear from you, I assume you're accepting or something like that. That's there, there's sometimes silence by admission can be uh, in play. Now, how do you, how do you um, get around this thing? I don't want to make a counter. If I really do want to buy, Jim's bike for seven hundred dollars, but man, I wish I, you know, I wish I could do a little bit better. How can I do it without making a counteroffer? Because I know Corman, he could be a real jerk. Once I make the counteroffer, and if he doesn't accept the counteroffer, he won't accept the full offer that he originally wanted. You know, he won't accept it. He, he's just—I'll give you an example. My father did that one time because he was an eccentric character. So you can do something called an inquiry. You say, hey, Corman, I'm not making a counteroffer. I know you want seven hundred dollars for your bike, but would you consider putting two new tires on it? Or would you consider, you know, changing out the pedals to different kind of pedals? That's not a counteroffer because you're making an inquiry. If I'm representing people that want to do that, I always say this is a mere inquiry and it is not a counteroffer to be clear because it's a fine line. What's a counteroffer and what's a mere inquiry over something like that? Um, and so that's that's one of the ways you get around saying, oh, I don't want to put a counteroffer. I don't want to kill that offer that's out there because counteroffers kill offers. But I want to know, I want to know, can, can they do something? Or would they be willing to do something potentially? And so we negotiate a little bit further on without killing that original offer. Um, and manner of acceptance. A lot of, back in the old days, I don't know why, I'm, I also teach a lot of history classes. I love history, but in the history of the law, or the old common law before we all adopted the UCC, you had to accept in the same exact form that the offer was made to you. So if I... If I, if I wrote you a letter in the old fashioned mail with a stamp, you would have to accept in a written form in a letter mailed back to me. And under the old rule, acceptance occurred at the moment it was stamped at the post office. That little stamp, that's why it was important on the outside of the envelope. If you ever see it, you'll see the time it was actually postage, which actually accepted at the post office. That's no, that's still a rule. The mailbox rule still exists when it comes to the, I don't like the rule because I might not get your acceptance for another couple of days, but the mailbox rule is very important. The offer or can also spell out how the acceptance has to occur. It has to be done only upon receipt of your written letter will acceptance be deemed complete, or it has to be done via fax or email or all these other modes of methodologies that are out there, you can stipulate it in the offer if you want. But if it's not there, the UCC decided, let's be practical. So if I sent you an email saying, I'll sell you my iPhone for $500, you could accept it in a text, 
you could accept it in email, you could accept it over the phone, and you could accept it in written form if I haven't limited the methodology by which you can accept. It's any reasonable mode of communication. Careful, if I give you a true or false question and I say true or false, an offeree can accept an offer in any form they decide. No, because any form is too broad. It has to be a reasonable form. So you can't say, you know, I practiced uh, how to send smoke signals or I'm a psychic. So I sent out or, you know, I, I hired a plane to write up. I accept above the person's property. And, and I thought that would be fun. Um, that's inappropriate because it's not a reasonable mode of acceptance. I think the book does a really nice job on chapter six. And I know some of you are already probably wrestling from chapter three, five, and now six on the case problems because they don't give you a ton of information. But I think as you try to do them, even if you get them completely wrong, I give almost full credit for a good faith attempt in trying to identify the rule, applying the rule that might be appropriate to that case problem and drawing a conclusion. Even if you're way up, I'm going to give you a great deal of credit. But just going through that mental exercise, I'll supply you with the model answer and hopefully it'll start, start really building out the concept of what is an offer and what are the elements in a valid offer, what is... Um, a counter offer and what is a valid acceptance of an offer and what kinds of methodologies or events can occur to kill an offer. Time, death, insanity, counter offer, the very term of the offer expiring, all those different things are going there. I hope this was a decent summary for you. I know I go long, but you know, we're in an online class and I feel like I have to you know, talk about the topics that I think are kind of important. If I said anything or done anything or the book does anything that comes up short, and I know there's that muddy water, contact me with the muddy water. Shoot me an email. Um, say, hey, Jim, you know, I'm going over this. I still don't get this principle. I don't get this principle of invitation to make offers. It's really confusing to me, and it confuses a lot of students. Don't be afraid to say that to me, and we'll try to have a conversation over the phone or in some emails and try to clarify it even further. Otherwise, be well.